A very, very warm welcome to everybody. Um, thank you for being here. And uh, especially to John. Uh, I think John needs no introduction. Um, John has been a, a social worker for 45 years, and now much of his work is taken up with whistleblowers. And I think this is going to be the first of a few discussions we'll have with John because uh, his work is very, very important here in South Africa at the moment. And it's nice to get a little bit of insight into what John is doing. So we're going to get the, the tip of the iceberg today and we'll definitely um, continue conversations like this going forward. And then Cynthia, thank you very much again for being with us today. Um, uh, Cynthia is the Cynthia Stimple is the SAA um, whistleblower. So Dudu Mieni is in hot water because of Cynthia. And then we we chatted to Martha um, again. Thank you and welcome, Martha. Martha is head of legal services at Prasa and testified at the Zondo Commission. And then we're waiting for Tiro or Lena. No, he's joined. Tiro's joined. He's just joined. He's joined. Tiro, would you like to uh, just have a quick hello and, and say hi to all of us? Yes, my name is Tiro. And, um, yeah, I'm, I work with Martha at the Passenger Rail Agency of South Africa. And yes, um, sorry, I'm late. Yeah, and, and, yes. and we work with John, who has been absolutely wonderful to us, but I'm sure we'll, we'll speak later about ourselves. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Tiro. So, John, over to you now for the rest of the meeting. Um, what I thought I'd do is to start off with a song. So people might be still coming late and they will at least take up a couple of minutes listening to the song. And yesterday, at Fridays, on John Perlman in 702 asked people to suggest a title of the song that um, represents how they're feeling about South Africa and the situation that we're in. And I'd already decided to use the song, and lo and behold, on John Perlman's show, somebody said, well, the song you need to, that describes the frustration and the difficulty we have in South Africa is this one. So I shall now go to screen sharing, and I will play it for you. And I'm going to just ask uh, my guests, uh, Tiro, Cynthia and Martha particularly to reflect on whether in fact and what to what extent the song also expresses something of the situation you experience as a whistleblower. <laughs> so there it is. to just have all those verses quickly because I was reflecting on this and thought you know it might an interesting sort of aspects of it but let me ask Martha Tiro and, and Cynthia because you've been forewarned about this and just any thoughts you have as you introduce yourself about your experience 
of apparently appearing not to get any satisfaction. Who wants to go first? Can I suggest Cynthia? <laughs> okay, I'll go first. Um, thank you, John. So, yes, it wouldn't be a song I would choose um, for me, for my experience, as I can get no satisfaction. But it does speak to me in the sense that while I was going through uh, my case um, with uh, Weber Wenzel as my lawyers, and with the SA, their lawyers being BMK Khaleesi, um, I did feel frustration, severe frustration in that, uh, firstly, uh, unlike Martha and Tiro, who are in the legal field, I was totally never in the legal field. So the way lawyers operated, I couldn't understand. It was, for me, slow. They had to go through every point and write up every paragraph, and we had to reread it and redo it and make sure I had all the facts. So I think that brought in a lot of frustration for me, so I can identify with the song in that light. Um, and um, it was a long, lengthy process that took almost a year um, with, on the legal side of it. So, yes, so that song speaks to uh, I can get no satisfaction because once the, my whole story ended with SAA and we parted um, in uh, towards literally, I would say, end of May to 2017, only um, then, even then, I felt this frustration and hence I needed to go. And, and get away and not feel this hatred and this pain and this frustration. And so that's when I did one of the Caminos where I felt I needed to walk to forgive and to, um, to release some of the, the anger and frustration that I felt. So, yes, John, that song does speak to that period um, from the frustration part. Thank you. Sorry, I just I muted myself because my dog started barking. Um, yes, Cynthia, thank you. Just for folks to know that I have, in fact, three interviews with uh, Cynthia because she's one of the people that was instrumental in getting me focused in this work, and they're on my YouTube channel. So we'll put that link up available for folks so she can hear her story and her marvelous way in which she just felt at the end of her kind of really feeling like frustrated and just not knowing what need to do next and she went on a retreat and a, a pilgrimage and how god spoke to her so we'll save that for you i've yet to have the next uh, uh, martha and tiro uh, on my youtube channel and that's because they are still involved in getting no satisfaction at all from price martha do you want to go first and say what is your, your situation. Uh, that's what you yeah, I can get no satisfaction. You know, I think for me, it's still ongoing, John and, and everybody else. Um, there is still no satisfaction. Uh, I guess from a personal perspective uh, in terms of one has to what one has to go through um, I mean our cases are still pending with Tiro and Tiro will speak for himself um, and you know when you talk to things of God uh, you, you never know it's always his will and uh, the timing is always his time and um, you know, patience becomes a virtue and one has got to continue to keep the faith um, because it sometimes, you know, dwindles because the satisfaction of having to finalize everything and, and getting this whole issue and, and trauma behind us is just not there. So, you know, sometimes I have to reflect and say, you know, um, there are perhaps other things that I need to focus on that um in fact god has created for me in 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 my space for instance you know i have time to be with my daughter when she's back from school i have time to you know carry on certain things that i don't think i would have been able to carry on with um 
had I been working at Prasa because we used to work horrendous hours. And, you know, sometimes I, I just have to reflect and say, perhaps this is a way of God rewarding me with time to rest. And sometimes we don't see it that way. We always want to be on the move and, and we want things to happen and to happen quickly. Uh, but one has the faith that somehow something will happen. So as a flash man right now, you know, um, it, is, it is that way that I'm still waiting for that satisfaction. And I know it will come when, uh, you know, uh, one will rejoice and will be vindicated. Uh, but as I say, it, it's just taking a toll on one. And I, I actually don't know when it is going to happen. But I'm hoping that it's soon because um, I also believe that God doesn't, you know, let you go through things that you can't carry, that you can't, you can't um, uh, go through with. So, yeah, that's where I am. I mean, emotional. I think for me, every time I have to speak about this experience, it, it wears me down. You know, it just wears me down because the injustice and the, the corruption that continues and the lies that continue about us. Sometimes one just feels um, defeated. Um, so, yeah, in a nutshell, John, that's what I will say for now. But um, as everybody knows, our, our cases are still pending at Prasa. Every time we go, you saw it yourself, John, the last time. There was a postponement of sorts. There's always chamors, as we say here in South Africa, nonsense. Uh, uh, and because they can't prove their cases against us. But we have to continue. And um, God knows when, when, you know, victory is going to, you know, abound on us. And we will carry on and, 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 and carry on with the strength uh, on, on a daily basis. Thank you very much. You're on mute, John. Okay, sorry, Tiro, is for you now to say your introductory thoughts. Yes, um, thanks, John, and and um, yes, good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, I think I'm relatively covered um, by both Martha and and, and, and Cynthia. <laughs> yeah, it's you know, it's I think you know, I'm I'm always intrigued by this country, always trying to understand it, and. And 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 it 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 I mean it it just continues to puzzle me you know it's you yeah that you know that a country with so much potential so much beauty with such beautiful people can just be going through so much for so long so consistently um, I mean it just it's it's like we don't get a reprieve okay now when you look back I mean we can do we we do see a bit of, I guess, the reprieve that we had, the satisfaction that we had. There was that, you know, those beautiful periods when Madiba was inaugurated as president. Then we went through a few years just of of, of a wonderful reprieve as a, as a people. Um, but I just think, you know, right now, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm just again reminded of growing up in the in the 80s being a teenager in 85 and in 86 and things were just so bleak um completely bleak uh, uh, being a teenager 15 16 in the townships and 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 now I'm a 50 year old man and I'm I'm looking back and and things are are bleak you know um but then I know that we've been through bleaker days things have been worse things have been bad um, things have been bad with this country, so so I'm always finding myself just you know just struggling between these different worlds, not getting satisfaction and then getting it, you know, um, and then uh, being invited to a meeting like this and a meeting like this giving me satisfaction. Wow, this is it's still a wonderful country. It's still a beautiful country. It's still as beautiful people, and then you know you switch on the news. Um, which I shouldn't do, and then you hear people in KZ10 um, just in a conference of the ANC singing uh, uh, songs praising the false prophet Jacob Zuma. And you just say, my goodness, 
people are just singing and they just people, men and women have just come together to go to praise a man, a false prophet. <laughs> and you know, I said, what kind of a country is this? This is madness. Mm-hmm. Um, but look, there, then, then I do get satisfaction, as I say, because of gatherings like this. And, and maybe just to conclude, uh, you know, um, because of people of, of, of real good strength and character, I'm going to mention Sophia. And I remember reading her story when it broke, I think, I don't know, 2018, 19, I'm not sure, um, or 17. And, and 16. I because, <laughs> 16. Yes. Um, I, I had, <laughs> for some reason, I still had some money then, and I had this, a subscription of Business Day and Financial Mail. And it would be covered then. I would, I would be so intrigued that I've never seen this woman. It would be interesting to meet this woman who's just taking on all of these powerful people. Who is this mad woman? And she took them on, and it was, you know, it was well covered. And I came to meet her, and it was a wonderful, just a wonderful experience through John. Um, and and I guess it's through, you know, Cynthia and and that uh, experience and John introducing us to Cynthia that has kept us going and. And again, then I get to the satisfaction that I say I'm not getting. And, and the satisfaction comes from the beauty of this country, its potential, but most importantly, just its wonderful and good people. So, John, that's my paradox, um, uh, paradoxical yeah. experience of the song. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, Tira, I have to say that <laughs> all I've really done is help to the you know, cre- manage the connective tissue between the whistleblowers that I've met and interviewed. And and then the miracle has happened. And, I mean, I always have a lot to say, but the things which I'm most proud of and pleased to see happen are the grace that seems to manifest itself when new connections are made between people, where they find a common interest and a common cause of the solidarity that then multiplies amongst them. And particularly when it comes to the issue of power, because after all, whistleblowers are there who speak truth to power. And power, as we conventionally know it, is power from above. It's, it's, you know, it's top down. Um, what we see happening amongst the whistleblower group is power with and power for. And it's actually an unstoppable force. And it's a multiplying force. It's, an, it's a resource which multiplies the more you connect. And that's why whistleblowers get so harshly retaliated against. And I want to just say that it's been, for me, a huge privilege just to be, to bear witness. And I've entitled this series, Wellbeing, Witness Bearing and Whistleblowing. But I'm, I've written a paper which will explain this and will be published next week on National Whistleblowers Day and people can read up all the conceptual stuff. But the point about bearing witness, um, I was very privileged to have for both Tiro and Martha to ask me and check with their lawyers if I could just simply observe their last disciplinary hearing and just sat there. And, I, and you know, I wasn't there to participate. I had to zip my lip and just watch. <laughs> and it was... I don't know what effect it had, but um, one sensed that these guys knew they were being watched. And they've been, we've been watched from perspective of somebody who have myself been a target of retaliation for speaking truth to power with a defamation slap suit against me, which is coming close to conclusion. A constitutional court's about to hand down judgment. And when that has happened, we will then have hopefully another session where I can unpack that. But all I wanted to just leave with you now is that there's a saying which I love from Kierkegaard. He says, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. And what the whistleblower community that I've been part of have helped me do is actually understand my life backwards. To the point where I'm almost grateful to the plaintiff who's suing me for 10 million because he, he doesn't know. And I don't think I, one day I might get to tell him he has helped me give an empathy and an insight of what whistleblowers go through when they are retaliated against. And in that sense, I've got a strong sense of, you know, God's grace at work. And I want to now just read a scripture reading, which uh, came my way this week. And let's just 
ask you to reflect on it and how this speaks to your situations. It's from Romans chapter 5, 1 to 5, and it's a paraphrase from Eugene Peterson's The Message. By entering through faith into what God has always wanted to do for us, set us right with the divine mystery and make us fit for God, we have it all together because God, because of our master Jesus. And that's not all. We throw open our doors to God and discover at the same moment that he has already thrown open his door to us. We find ourselves standing where we always hoped we might stand, out in the wide open spaces of God's grace and glory, standing tall and shouting our praise. There's more to come. We continue to shout our praise even when we're hemmed in with troubles because we know how troubles can develop passionate patience in us and how that patience in turn forges the tempered steel of virtue, keeping us alert for whatever God will do next. In alert expectancy such as this, we're never left feeling shortchanged. Quite the contrary, we can't round up enough containers to hold everything God generously pours into our lives through the Holy Spirit. Uh, Martha, Cynthia, Tiro, does this passage speak to your situation? Does it give you some deeper insight into your experience? What spiritual practices have helped you keep, keep you hopeful? Maybe, Cynthia, if you could go first and just tell us, because she got me praying the rosary again because I hadn't played, prayed it for decades. <laughs> That's a good pun there, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, when I decided to speak out, it wasn't an overnight decision, and it wasn't a decision that was made in a short space of time. It was a decision that took um, many discussions with my family through prayer. I even went to my priest to talk to him about it. Um, discussions with my husband, my daughters, my siblings. Even my peer groups at SA, and I'm sure other whistleblowers similarly. It's a decision you 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 realize something's wrong, and you're asking others. You can see something's wrong. Can we do something about it? And in my case, from a work perspective, my colleagues said we need our jobs. We're not doing anything. Um, from a sibling perspective my sibling said to me you know you'd lose your job um why don't you walk away why don't you resign and uh, my answer to them was i'm not worth my salt um if i walk away i am not i cannot call myself this group treasurer if i should walk away and i said i cannot allow this to happen on my watch uh, for my husband and my children, there were many discussions, and the discussions were more, mom, is there anything you can do? My husband saying, is there anyone else you can tell to so that they take the burden from you and it's not your burden, you know? And and it is in that period that I um, had my faith challenge me is saying, Lord, you're asking me to do something that is heavy and hard, and I don't know if I have the strength to do it or carry it through. And there's, there's a scripture reading which Martha had already mentioned earlier on, which says, God does not give you um, obstacles or struggles or the rock to carry if he doesn't feel that you, um, you haven't got the, the strength to carry it or bear the burden. And um, I had to trust the process. So once I actually made the decision, which was a couple of times, it wasn't once. And I think that's what John's alluding to when he said earlier, the first time I was actually walking on a pilgrimage when my deputy signed a document, which I had said to him, do not sign in my absence. And it was then I took the decision, although six months prior, I've already been talking about my to my family because I was very uncomfortable with what was going on at SAA. And that's when I wrote my first whistleblowing message to National Treasury, but via WhatsApp. And my thoughts then were 
that I'm putting myself, my career on the line here, but I have to trust the process. I have to trust God. If he's leading me this path, I've got to allow him to hold my hand. Even at times I felt I was blind, that I had no idea where I was walking. And even at times when I knew I couldn't go on, those times I knew he was carrying me. So uh, for me, that was really what got me through is that I know, especially the times of the legal side and the attacks I got from SAA, it was so bad that they, they after I, I managed to interdict and stop the actual BNP deal from happening, which saved SAA from spending $256 million, which would never have been recouped, they then went on a character assassination. And it was strange that my very CFO, who hardly wanted any meetings with me, wrote the most horrendous things in her statement and affidavit against me, saying, I would walk, she made it like it's a habit, I would walk into our office and scream and swear at her. And I just burst into tears because I hardly, the, my most word I would use only if I'm really angry, it's bloody, but nothing else, you know, and I don't even insult a person in that way. So it, it's not in my language. It's not in my vocabulary. It's not in my character. And she, she said things like, um, I always attacked managers. I attacked my staff. It was, so it was things that there was no proof of, that no evidence. It was always about what I did and how I did it. But it reduced me to tears because it was just something I, I said, but this isn't me. And it was actually my daughters and husband who said to me, Cynthia, take it where it comes from. They are standing with their back against the wall. They don't know how to react. And the only reaction they can do is to victimize you, to run you down, to give you the character assassination. And it was only then when I rethought and saying, you know, what, don't internalize this, don't take the pain on you. And so, but it was a hard journey. And it, it wasn't because every time we go to court, there's new <laughs> character attacks, you know, so, and you have to read it because you're going to be presenting yourself. And so it, I couldn't hide it or pretend it wasn't there. I had to read it and prepare and steal myself. So just during that time, I must say that I had to constantly say, Lord, carry me because I really don't think I can cope. I really don't think I can go ahead. And um, yeah, so I did get through it and by the grace of God, if I may leave it there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I just say, before I ask Martha and Tira, just for anybody who got questions, just uh, write them in the chat box um, because that'd be a more efficient way. And um, I, and if we can then take that to the general discussion. Yeah. Tira, do you want to say in terms of your own what this has done for your own spirituality and faith. You know, well, for, for me, John, I mean, it's, it's actually, it's interesting, this question. This, this has done uh, a lot um, for me. Um, you know, I, uh, maybe let me start here. <laughs> I've, I've gone back to church, mother laughs at me. Because uh, I just, you know, now as, as Martha says, when you when you were, I was just too busy, I'm just just too caught up in being caught up. I didn't go to church, and I started going back to to church. But but even more fascinating, I I, I found myself, and I just, I've, you know, at school, and I used to love um, praying the memorare and just school. It just was one of my favorite prayers and I hadn't said it in a long time. I called myself maybe a year or two ago, just remembering that memory. You know? um, and and it just kept me going. I just love it now. I say uh, the Hail Holy Queen. And I just I just love those two prayers for some reason because I think 
you know, I just love, there's something about Mother Mary and, and there's something about, I think, just women generally, but in my life, who've just, just always held me. Um, and, and, and I fall in love with these prayers. I love, I love the concept, uh, you know, in our faith of, of intercession. And I just love how these two, these two prayers, you know, um, Hail Holy Queen and the Namorare, how, how they're just there to intercede on our behalf. Please, I'm not worthy. Help me. Please pray for me. Um, yeah, so, so that, has, that has been quite just, yeah, I've just gone back there in quite, in quite, um, in quite a serious way. But then there's something, I mean, there's, I really mean it here, John. And so, so I just, I love the gift of human beings just generally. I mean, I just, I just think the gift of, of human beings is just a beautiful gift for me. One of the most important gifts in my life, um, just was just meeting and working with Martha, um, um, Martha is, is formidable. She's fierce, um, but she's just also absolutely crazy. She's just absolutely mad. So, <laughs> you know, so, um, and in, she just wakes up in the morning and she's very clear about what is right and what is wrong. You know, no, no buts, no in between. I think men in general, I think we, in, especially at work, we, we, we create a lot of gray areas for our survival and, and, you know, to make it, to survive, to rise through the ranks. So, you know, and, and I had become very good at that, very adept at that until <laughs> I stumbled into Martha and she, she rocked that world. And I, Martha would be very clear, no, this is wrong. And this is, this is illegal and this is unlawful. And, you know, and, and I came to appreciate that quite a, a lot, not a bit, quite a lot um, from her. So she's been a wonderful gift and a, and a wonderful ally. Like I said, I read um, Cynthia's story um, at that time. And in fact, I was again and, and again, the, just the, the, the power of women and women in my life. Um, I read that when Cynthia was going through this and I was reading a lot about her, I have not having set eyes on her and just the principal staff. We also had in the country another woman, Tulima Donsela, who in a very quiet way was just unbelievably steely, you know, also very clear about what is right and what was wrong and just and 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 so I've just you know and and and, and I guess the last it's that that part about uh, where is this um, that um, uh, you know, quite to the contrary, we can't round up enough containers to hold everything. God generously pours into our lives through the Holy Spirit. And for me, these people, uh, they were just all of that, that pouring um, into my life. And so, you know, yes, things have been really tough. Things have been really bad. But one of the key, key gifts has been just these allies um, that I've had. And I guess the key thing of of a world like this and this kind of assault on us is really to isolate, is, is to feel, you know, you must end up feeling alone and isolated and lost. And, you know, because you, you must be made to, to look mad and to look crazy. And like Cynthia says, I mean, if people say, you know, she's insulting them and she's swearing at them, yeah, everybody says, hmm, yeah, it looks like this woman is really cuckoo. It looks like there's something wrong about her still. It's to feel isolated, it's to be isolated and to doubt yourself. And and yes, like, things have been really bad, but these gifts that I've mentioned um, and these people have just been truly wonderful and this pouring, I mean, this this pouring of, of, of these gifts through the spirit. And, and John has been then very central to it. But it was nice, it's, it's, it's really nice being in this fight and this, this passage having having good allies and and in my own immediate experience having having to fight this fight with Martha and with Fanny who's who's left Pasa maybe just to give a sense to the to the to the you know to the to, to, to the attendees here to is that Pasa has seventeen thousand employees and it's only been Martha and I now and Fanny who've had to take on all of these giants amongst seventeen thousand people. And and they didn't spare any bullet, um, and they came after us in a proper proper way. Um, so we were meant to be isolated, to be you know nothing, to be dirt. 
you found the most powerful allies in civil society, in John, in Cynthia, and in many, many other good people. And this is yet another um, platform just of support and literally of the Holy Spirit, of these gifts that can be contained. Thanks, Pastor. Mm. Uh, so humbling. Thank you. Martha, wonderful name, Martha, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Um, I just want to, you know, I think for me, I've just opened up the Beatitudes. And uh, what that has kept me really going is blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say, all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You know, I look, I, I think I've shared this with you, uh, John, before. I'm born, bred, buttered, and everything Catholic. I went to a Catholic school uh, from a very young age. I'm Catholic. I've been very active in the church. I sang in the choir. I even went to Bible school to understand certain things in my life. So for me, you know, my work situation has always been, I know who my provider is. And my provision only comes from one person, and that is God. And therefore, in everything that I do, I need to be excellent in it because I know where my provision comes from. So, you know, as Tiro says, it's, it's always been very clear to me that um, I will not be swayed. Come hell or high water. I mean, I've been at this uh, since 20 say 2014 um, in my life you know at Prasa I've been involved I don't know how many times I've been fired I've been I've been suspended I've been put on special leave only to return every single time I return and and, and I give grace to God for that because it it is it's 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 through him that these things are happening and I and I believe that uh, through my journey I've been tested in many ways. And there are tests that I know I have failed drastically uh, being a child of God and having taken a particular path in my life. I mean, I remember in 2011, 12, when I, for the first time, had my blood pressure going sky high and my, I had migraines coming from Timbuktu. And, and I, those are things I've never had. And I... You know, instead of praying about things, I went and got medical um, assistance and I just couldn't, I couldn't deal with it. I just couldn't deal with the taking of the medication. And when these persecutions continued to happen, I then had to reflect and say to myself, what is God trying to tell me? Because every time I want to move, I've never worked in an institution for more than five years. And every time I need to move, it happens. And for me, it's been by the will of God. And so this time, it's been very tough because I've had my fights with God where I've said, what the hell do you want from me? Show me what it is that you're asking me to do. And, um, you know, with the challenges and the persecutions and everything that I've had to go through, I've had to step back and say, you know, Perhaps I need to realize and acknowledge my provider. And, you know, God says, uh, vengeance is mine. And, and I needed to step back and, and, and heed to that. So when I was fired in, in 2021, I think it is, yes, January, I really took a deep breath and I thought, huh, okay, I've been at this thing uh, for quite some time and I'm really tired now. 
And I think I mustn't necessarily fight this thing uh, spiritually so hard because perhaps God is saying to me, uh, you've done enough, my child. This is my fight for you. And I want you to be out of prasa so that I can fight this fight on your behalf without you necessarily being there. And I had to reflect and look at it that way, you know, um, and, and, and thank him for that and let go where I could. But, uh, you know, as a, as, as a person of the flesh, you always come back and you, you want to be able to say, I want this thing to happen and it must happen in my own time. So I always have to remind me and myself that um, this is not uh, my will. This is not my fight. It's God's fight. And, and, and the victories that we have seen, I attribute them to God because had it not been for him, you know, I don't think we would be here where we are. So I have been, um, I have, I, sometimes it's very hard and, and keeping the faith is, is very difficult. Uh, but I always remind myself and I go back and I know the power of prayer. I also went on pilgrimage. I went to, to, to Ngome. And, and in the bus, all that we prayed was the rosary. I hadn't prayed the rosary in a very long time, John, as well. I had never cried praying the rosary. But having to say the Hail Mary, having to say the glory be, and having to say the Our Father, the many times that I said it, and the meaning that it then gave me, really brought tears to my eyes because I then understood really what these prayers mean. So, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's the journey and, and, and I'm hanging on for dear life and I'm hoping I'm, I'm, I know, and, and, and I want to keep my faith that God is going to, to pull through for me. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I just feel such enormous privilege again. And I just at the same time, and I want to just, before we open up the last 10 minutes or so for conversation, it's just to lay this as the burden that's on me, and if I can share it within our, our Rua faith community, is that I feel that I can sit and observe Martha and Tiro going through this kind of process of disciplining inquiries and all the rest. But then the obvious thought comes up to me, why is Prasa still doing this, and why are we letting them do that? So there's a sense in which I feel like in solidarity with you that maybe we need to put together a letter from our community and go and see the Minister of Transport, Fikhele Mbulula, and Lenin Ramatlakana, the chairman of the board, and saying these are people who are being subjected to gross injustice, projection, scapegoating, all this. I can, I mean, somebody else is going to have to moderate it, and I'm sure somebody like Natanda will help me put it in good language. But I do think that there's a, a, a sense of burden on me to want to be able to say, can we do that? Shall we do that? And I just would leave, put that out there and just say, is that something which um, other people would feel their, the spirit saying yes this is something we can do. Because Paul's letters, you know, they had a great impact. <laughs> Writing things down and putting them out and sending them around, you know, it, it does expose things. Okay, let's open up for conversation and uh, questions. I mean, the, uh, firstly, Nontando is thanking you so much, Cynthia. Uh, Brian saying thank you for your strength and faith openness to what is – it, what is and what may be deeply touched me. Thank you. Any other people want to kind of comment? Just put up your hand and and speak. Anyone? Mm. Uh, yes, Rani. Um, I'm in the UK, and we've had lots of whistleblowing lately as well, thanks to the government and its handling and doing things. I, I'm wondering, in South Africa, do you have 
anything like 38 degrees or a vase or anything like that to start petitions. Hmm. Yeah, Cynthia, you answer that, yeah. Um, thank you for your question, Roni. Yes, we do. It, um, a vase is not is global, so many of us respond to a vase. We don't have the thirty eight degrees, but we do have other. It's any petition. It's designed as a petition, and you give your cause. Recently, we had a case with a doctor Tim Demaya, whereby his fifteen year old daughter. Um, he was suspended for writing an open letter about the conditions of the hospitals um, where he works. He's a pediatrician yeah, and he okay. works at Raima Musa. And he put this open letter out into the media just explaining and, and uh, uh, regarding the conditions and how bad him as a doctor feels when he's trying to save a child's life and there's power outages or there's no water, you yeah. can't wash your hands, all that and he was suspended. And with that, within 24 hours, there were over 30,000 people who responded to a petition and his suspension was uplifted. Yeah. So, yes, so we do have those type of movements. We've got many others, um, like the whistleblowers for change, which John's involved in, the active citizens movement. Um, um, I'm involved in the whistleblower house. And we've got many other non-profit organizations that work there. We have Aris Danikas online here, and he works for Blueprint. And maybe, John, is it possible we can get Aris to just talk about his case and maybe what gave him the courage to speak out against SAPS and to, um, to make that big change of taking his wife for safety to Greece and, and what gave him the... You know, for me, the courage that you can continue. So here's another whistleblower that is is also on in our group here. Thank you. Okay, um, I must say just before I, I mute myself again, this has been one of the biggest privileges of my life, mm. is listening to you. I am mm. just so grateful mm. um, to, to Bonnie and John and everybody else who's organized this. Mm. I, I can't Thank you, Rania. Right it, it's really encouraging to us, and I, and I certainly want to say I, I, I'm so grateful for Aris <laughs> for being here, and by all means, tell us a bit about your experience. Yes. Aris is the guy that actually got me into this trouble, because he approached me two years ago, and he said, John, I need to lodge a complaint with the press council, with the ombudsman, for uh, failure to give me a right to reply to an article written by Jacques Poe who in Daily Maverick. <laughs> and I said, oh my gosh, what have I got myself in for? Jacques Poe has written the bestseller book. Daily Maverick is this very strong, surely. But anyway, Aris prevailed and we came through that and Daily Maverick was forced to apologize. I have got an interview also on my YouTube channel with, in fact, Cynthia and Nolene, where we talk with Aris about the experience that he's gone through. But Aris, do you want to quickly give us an introduction to that? Because we're running out of time. We've only got five more minutes. Hi, thank you, John. Hello, everybody. I don't want to hijack that panel with my story. Um, very briefly, you know, it's been a privilege, you know, knowing John Clark and, and, and some of you guys are in South Africa. It was very difficult for me to, to open that door and enter South Africa for, um, you know, over 10 years or 13 years I'm away. Um, I was knocking, but nobody was answering. And that was the same story with the media in South Africa. Um, you know, I don't know if um, some of you know my story or not, but I was the one that blew up the whistle for the Katamani unit story in South Africa. I was a reservist, you know, a volunteer who wanted to, to uh, provide my community. And uh, it went all south when I discovered uh, torture, extrajudicial killing, and racism within, within the, the unit that I actually was assigned. Um, I'm Greek, I'm a North Coast Greek, I grew up in Greece, so I did not agree with that, I did not sign for that, so I just basically refused to be part of that unit, and I started documenting, you know, some atrocities with a calculated risk, 
I'm going to try to blow the whistle or help break loose. So I'm sort of listening to everybody, and especially Cynthia. And it's a deja vu that character assassination process, as, as Cynthia um, related earlier on, it's again playing back in my mind what I went through. Um, you know, going through a direct danger to my life and my wife's life, and we end up running away. Like you know, mm. it, it was like an escape goal. I had to run away and save myself. So we did this, and then all hell break loose. Because if they cannot kill you, just tell you they will try to character assassinate you. So I had to suffer over a period of eight years, where I was trying to, to help you know the the, the NPA to get accountability for the families of those tortured and get, got killed all those years. And eventually I had to, basically I was too horrified to open the, you know, the internet and, and look at all those publications against me without ever giving me a right of reply or tell my story. So anyway, that was that. Um, what is interesting, John, is that uh, your choice of, uh, of that song, because what people don't know is that, uh, Keith Richard actually contributed that phrase. I don't get no satisfaction, but his mentor was Chuck Berry <laughs> from the song 30 Days. And the lyric was, if I don't get no satisfaction from the judge, <laughs> that's, that's related <laughs> because we have a proper legislative process in South Africa and the influence of it. So I thought I was making these comments quite interesting. And for Tiro, my friend Tiro, very interesting what you said about the situation with many women at the place of work. So I will dedicate that song from, in a second, I'm getting old, from James Brown. A man's world <laughs> will be nothing without a woman. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Ari. Yeah. Um, we've got two minutes, and I want to. I did see Nintendo's hand up, but I've asked Nintendo to actually close for us in prayer too. So, Nintendo, do you want to offer th comment, observation, thoughts? Because I, I, I have to say, you know, you've taken a great personal interest in the whistleblowing cause and have been very supportive to me personally, and that's that's encouraged me. So, you've been a, a witness bearer with me. So thank you, and I, I, I bow to you as as as, as an elder <laughs> in the spirit, not necessarily in, in years. <laughs> it's, it's both. It's both. I, I am older than you, so don't look at. Um, I I just uh, I think um, I'm thinking of that scripture. I think it's a story where um, David. Um, I think he. One of David's soldiers uh, sacrificed uh, to get David water, and David said, "You know, I cannot drink this; it's too sacred." And he poured it on the ground as a sacrifice uh, to God. And and I think it captures um, what we've been hearing: these stories of profound courage, these um, the attacks. I, I I just found the you know just the attacks and your experiences. Uh, the harassment and the terror that has been inflicted on you, uh, just something very difficult to process. And, you know, it struck me, and I think it's, it strikes all of us, how these are individuals, how, how you know, that these, the, the, the courage of you as individuals coming to those places where you're making an ethical decision and thinking to myself, how how do we build into our faith into our institutions the the, the a pro whistleblower ethic uh, where you know whistleblowers are supported and recognized for the courage uh, for what they do what what needs to happen in our institutions so that the, the this kind of ethics and becomes part of the institution to say we are committed to you know, to, to these ethics and those that, um, you know, creating those open spaces just in honor of your lives, that your experiences uh, feed into a different kind of way of, of institutions, a different kind of um, openness uh, to, to, to and, and even spaces within institutions that are created um, in honor of what you have done and the sacrifices. And I think it, it, it aligns with our faith. 
that all that is ever done for the good of humanity comes from sacrifice, comes from ethical decisions. And I just wanted to honor you. And I think um, the comments on the in the chat are those comments that honor you and, and what it has done for me uh, to ask, you know, what are the, the things in my life that need those kind of ethical decisions to stand up for the truth in our, in our, in our lives, in our day-to-day -day lives. We can be whistleblowers even in our own families, in our own communities, that that culture and what you have articulated needs to be framed into our teachings of ethics um, so that we, we honor uh, the, the role and the significance of whistleblowers. So honoring you at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Nintendo. And before we close us and take us through our closing prayer, I just want to make an, one announcement. Um, she wasn't able to join us today, but there's another whistleblower who is just, I mean, I have shared in our Rua community WhatsApp about her, is uh, Patricia Machale. And um, she is actually in hiding at the moment. She, uh, having blown the whistle on corruption in the SAPS, and um, but special assignment will be broadcasting the first of a two-part series this Tuesday at the 26th of July on SABC3 at 8.30 in the evening. So I can ask you to please make a note and watch that. And then the second part will be broadcast, I think, a week later. But it's just another instance of where people ask me, John, why do you do this work? And I said it's because people like Patricia do their work and I, I mean it, it's just enormous privilege to me to do that so I just wanted to uh, invite people to watch that and then to thank everybody for giving us the necessary encouragement is what <laughs> Paul says you know in that letter about this abundance seems to just multiply um, and we can't contain it because that's what grace is it's something that can't be contained within our command and control sort of you know vessels you know it just keeps blowing and sp and spreading so thank you so much to you all okay hey, Nontando, can you thank hmm? you uh, john thank you before you hand over to Nontando, um yeah. i just uh, like to say a few things and then and then we'll hand over to Nontando. Okay. first of all john um so we've all that are here today and further afield have um, great respect for you for creating this container that is trustworthy, safe, holy, and sacred. Mm. You're making new connections, solid, uh, solidarity that is powerful and that has a huge force mm. and that is continuing. Then I just want to highlight um, a few notes I made from each person, and I might actually make a summary and email it to everybody because I've been getting WhatsApps of people telling me that they're in tears while listening. And um, I've had to ignore my WhatsApps because it was distracting. <laughs> people have been very, very moved by your testimonies here today and by John creating the space for, for you to share with us. So very briefly, Cynthia, I loved what you said when you said you needed to walk to forgive. Martha, timing is always God's time. And your time to rest and your faith I know it will come. Tiro, my heart went out for you when I wanted to cry when you said there's no, there was no reprieve when you were young. And now when you're in your middle age, there's no reprieve again. It's bleak. Yet your faith came through and the pockets of satisfaction that are so meaningful to you. And your, your, no, I got a sense of knowing that uh, you are, your faith is truly strong and growing uh, in this journey. 
And then, um, Cynthia, quickly, God does not give you struggles if you haven't got the strength to carry the burden. And you have to trust the process. Don't internalize your struggles. Tyrol, your reference to Mary reminded me that Mary held Jesus through his very traumatic life. It was never easy for Jesus. And Mary held him. And I got a sense you're allowing Mary and all the powerful women in your life and your respect for women came through so strongly. So um, the power of women and the power of being held by these women was just beautiful. Thank you for that. And thank you for the reference to our beloved Tuli Madonsela. And then Martha... Blessed are those who are persecuted. Powerful in your faith and trust of God came through. You are totally real and honest with God, and I love that. And you are sure of your power of prayer. And Iris, I'd like to invite you to a coffee with God, please. Mm -hmm. With John. And then, um, Nontando, thank you um, for your words in bringing um, honor to their lives and, and reminding us for the, to be mindful of the ethical truths in our daily lives and for us to, to have the courage also to follow that through. So in closing with that, is there anybody who's, who would like to have something else to say before we close? We, we're running over, but it's very important, so we can't stick to exactly one hour. Um, anybody before Nantanda closes in prayer? Maybe just a question. Uh, what do you as whistleblowers need from us as a community of faith? You know, I was wondering about that because it really sounds... Uh, like it could be a lonely journey. So what do you need from community of faith to support you? Aris. Uh, thank you. What's important is not to brand whistleblowers. We do that now. What is important is for the communities and the society to incorporate the whistleblower concept. So, in fact, it comes without saying that we all have a whistleblower concept within us. Our future communities, our children, will have it within them, within their, within these society's standards or, or ethics. So we don't need to actually go through that process of pointing out whistleblowers. If we can teach our communities and our children from, a, from school, okay? We teach them at, at school and at, at, and at home to know how to stand up and, and, and speak about wrongdoing and corruption, I believe that's going to solve out a lot of problems for future generations and for whistleblowers. Thank you. So that would start with parents that are here with us today, grandparents that are here with us today, teachers that are here with us today. And then there's always the Holy Spirit and the ripple effect these things have when we just begin them. So thank you for that. Anyone else? And then over to Nontando. Thanks, Bonnie, if I may go. So <clears throat> a total support from communities, especially faith-based communities of whistleblowers. Um, what I found sad is being Catholic, is that um, I, I had support within my small community because I'm also in, in a youth group. Uh, not a youth group. I run a youth group, um, but uh, in, in my choir that I, uh, but very small. But the rest of the community does not speak up, and I'm meaning the broader Catholic community. In that, our bishop has said no support. Bishop Buti Tlakadi has said nothing. Um, Neither has any of the priests. 
So if uh, we in this faith group can just spread the word amongst the people that we have influence, let them make the change. And I agree totally with Iris that it has to start at schools because if we don't, we as parents inculcate a level of, of um, principles and values in our in our children. But once they leave the home, they're in the school ground, they see bullying right there on the school ground. They are afraid to say anything and teachers hide it. They try and keep quiet or brush it over. That's where we need to start because it reaches to the boardrooms. It reaches to the corporates. That's where the big bullies happen. And we can see it playing out in Prasa right now. And obviously it played out at SAA and Eskom and Danel. But we can see it prevalent now in Prasa because they still have the upper ground. So, yeah, I feel as faith-based communities, we have to start within our own Try and fix where we are, have that ripple effect where you are. Throw that first pebble in and make the change where you are. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I've got so much food for thought, all sorts of ideas tumbling out. Next week is, in fact... International Whistleblowers Day. So we've had like a week before that, and there's going to be activities and announcements and stuff in the media. So keep watch for those and through your social networks and your connections and friends to spread that word um, and see if truth can bring power to account. Okay, Nantanda, do you want to? So before we close, one more thing from me. We want to have a discussion with John because he is holding a very important container for everybody, for you guys, whistleblowers. So we will have another Coffee with God conversation with John to hear about he must be struggling too. It must be a huge burden for John to carry what he's carrying. And as a social worker, so we will create the space where we can hear from John himself, and I'll let everybody know when that happens. Thank you. Okay, Brian. final from me. Mm. Okay. Uh, thank you. I will be reading the Franciscan uh, blessing. May God bless us with the restless discomfort about easy answers half-truths and superficial relationships so that we may seek truth boldly and love deep within our hearts. May God bless us with holy anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that we may tirelessly work for justice, freedom, and peace among all people. May God bless us with the gift of tears to share with those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, or the loss of all that they cherish, so that we may reach out with our hands to comfort them and transform their pain into joy. May God bless us with enough foolishness to believe we, we really can make a difference in this world, so that we are able, with God's grace, to do what others claim cannot be done and the blessing of God, the Supreme Majesty, and our Creator, Jesus Christ,